Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, the host of your chats that I produce with Mistress Joanne Gaddy. Today, I'm sitting down for a chat with Magnus Hakanorsen, who is in Iceland. Magnus is the former chairman and one of the founders of the Icelandic BDSM organization. He originated the current Munches in Iceland, and he's one of the organizers of the Icelandic BDSM scene. So Magnus, welcome to the Fireside Chats. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, I'm very happy that you can be part of this. Did you notice the uh, image that I have, the backdrop? Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I, I took this picture when I was in Reykjavik about two years ago. Okay. Awesome. But I don't remember the name of the street. I'm sorry. Uh, Stigur. Ah, easy Probably. for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> so let us begin at the beginning. Um, tell us a little bit about growing up in Iceland. Well, my childhood was just the normal, as normal as it can be. Uh, for my generation, you, uh, I went to work on a farm in, on the east side of the country. I, I live in Reykjavik. I started to work on a farm when I was 12. Uh, spent the summers in the East Fjords on a small farm for two summers. Just basic stuff, working, working in the summer um, and going through school in the wintertime. I found out early that I was not like uh, the general public, we can say. How did you find out? Uh, well, it just... Uh, uh, norm uh, interests in bondage, we can say, and and things like that. That was uh, the main the main thing. And uh, I went into pet store when I was twelve, and bought some dog collars, collars and uh, leashes. But I have never owned a, owned a dog. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but. Yeah, that and that was the thing. I, I had I have no idea what was going on with myself at the time. I, uh, I found out in in some uh, in school library a book about sexuality that uh, there were people who liked to be tied up, and that just sparked my interest. Playing cops and robbers, all 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 the normal childhood stuff, but that that was the thing and. Uh, I think it was uh, not until I was probably about 14, 15, I found out uh, a magazine about uh, S&M. Uh, the British Forum, I think it was called, small, uh, small size. It consisted of uh, letters from, from readers, advice columns, personal ads, and things like that. And this is probably about 1984, 1985. How did you find this? Just in a bookstore. Uh, just normal bookstore, top shelf, of course. And I remember uh, vividly one time with an older woman who sold me one of the, I think, uh, I think the title of, 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 of the magazine was Why Are You an S&M Lover? Oh. And she specifically put it in transparent shopping bag, <laughs> trying to embarrass me or something. I have no idea, but, mm -hmm. but that was not the norm, carrying, getting things in a transparent plastic bags or shopping bags. But, but this, this magazine, yeah, the information in it saved me to know that there was somebody out there like me. At that time, I think Iceland must have been a very isolated country. There was no yeah. internet, very yeah. limited television. So a magazine like that had to be very unusual. Yeah, it, it was, uh, this magazine was uh, kind of, uh, kind, we could say educational safe sex uh, magazine. It, uh, it was one issue that was uh, for uh, kind of a BDSM uh, emphasis mm. 
So, but normally it was not. So this was kind of a, a breakthrough or, or a, you some, some kind of, uh, yeah, breakthrough moment for me finding it. Were you specifically looking for something like that? Probably, you know, uh, you're young, you're exploring, uh, and there is something that you find more interesting uh, and you just, yeah, there is some, some magnet that drives you through it. I, uh, that's the only explanation, explanation that I have for that. Uh, and yes, there was no internet. Uh, the television was uh, all evenings, but not on Thursdays. There was no television on Thursdays and mm. no television in July because then was summer vacations. Oh, interesting. And we had one radio station. Yes. Wow. So when you were looking at this magazine, you mentioned you discovered other people had a similar interest to you. Did you learn anything else from it? No, basically uh, just that BDSM, well, S&M, like it was called then, uh, was a thing. Uh, and what I had been doing uh, privately, non-sexually, uh, was uh, a thing for more people than me. And so it, it opened up my eyes for uh, everything BDSM uh, connected. So, yeah. How did you begin to find this world? In 1987. I dated uh, a girl who told me that she was not in some pillow talk. She told me she was not into kink at all. I did not bring it up, but she brought it up and said she was not into any kink. That, that moment I decided, well, okay. I'm not going to spend my life uh, not doing things that I craved. So I ended that relationship soon after that. Later on, I, some years after, I wondered, well, was she trying to fish or trying to bring the, bring the discussion into that area or something? Was she testing me? I have no idea. But it uh, the re relationship ended there. Mm. Uh, Nothing happened really, uh, well, this is one thing that happened. In 1987, I saw Rocky Horror Picture Show. Ah. Uh, and don't be it, no, don't dream it, be it. That phrase did everything. Is <laughs> responsible for everything. It opened my eyes. Uh, you see something that you dwell on and... Uh, I saw, uh, and basically nothing happens after that until uh, the internet, uh, IRC, yeah. or IR, IRC chat channels mm. that you could connect to, and that opened my world. You know, you could talk to like-minded people all over, all over the world. So, and I, I had been. Uh, starting to try to find uh, like-minded people without success. <clears throat> I, in 1988, when I was 18, I put in uh, an ad in one of the newspapers, personal ad, looking, okay. for, pe looking for people into S&M, leather, spankings, and things like that. And it was... Uh, Censored, never printed. Oh. Then, then you had this I'm alone in the world feeling of it. Uh, there was no way to connect to other, other people. Uh, I had no idea or connections into the uh, gay world or, or LGBT world at the moment. It was so uh, far away mm. that I, I could not, I was just, it, I just didn't imagine that how I, I would fit in, in that. But I heard rumors 
the men's motorcycle club or MSC Iceland that was operating from 1985. Uh, the National Queer Organization in Iceland was formed in 1978. So it's all kind of uh, was still kind of new in, in that time. Uh, <clears throat> and most people, uh, who, who, most queer people in the past, they went abroad. You couldn't, you, you didn't stay in Iceland. You went to Denmark, you went to Germany or, uh, uh. To, to, to be yourself. And it was very difficult to just to find out. You, I, I had no idea about uh, about these things. There was no connection. But but I found out. Yeah, there was a club, but it was far away, and I had no idea about it. Far away in Iceland or else? No, just 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 far away in your mind. You know, it's it's uh, so uh, so outlandish. There was no, no there was no no connection, and and. I I wasn't gay. I didn't belong. I, I mean, it was not for me to get there because I wasn't gay. Mm, mm, mm. <clears throat> mm. Yeah, in 1995, I started to educate people about BDSM. How did you do this? Uh, people from the uh, uh, chat channels. I said, hey, I have toys and I can show you. I'll talk about, about BDSM. And they said yes, and that was the beginning of my BDSM education, uh, teaching other people about BDSM. How did people respond to this? Uh, well, quite well. That is, those who attended, because uh, it was it was kind of you know talking to my friends about this. About that time, I started to reach out, uh, trying to connect to the. BDSM organizations in the Scandinavia, in Denmark and Norway, mm, mm. but it was far. It was uh, everything was hush, you know, kind of forbidden. So much taboo about it, everything. So it's very difficult to connect. It, 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 it's not like today when you can find all the information. You didn't know what people to talk to, and nobody. You know, you didn't know what people to trust and people elsewhere didn't know how to trust or whatever. So it was very difficult. And uh, in, yeah, 96, 97, uh, I met up enough people on, on the chat channels that uh, were interested in creating an organization. In the website was put up in 31st of December 1997. What website? I'm sorry. Uh, the Icelandic the website for the Icelandic BDSM organization. Ah, okay. Which hadn't been formed yet. Okay. And, and we had the first uh, official meeting in January in uh, 1998. And the, the first questions we were trying to get answer, answers to was, uh, is BDSM legal? Uh, what we had been seeing uh, all around us was uh, the Spanner case. That was, yes. that was that in, in what media we, you could uh, read about, find, you, you, we saw the Spanner case. And that was, uh, yeah. Where are we compared to them? Yes. And that influenced us a lot. How so? <clears throat> Just uh, trying to get legal advice uh, and just be aware of uh, you could be judged in, 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 in a similar way. So it, it was, it was, we were scared about these things. It was, you, you were uncertain. What legal advice were you given? Uh, well, uh, the legal advice uh, we were giving uh, given was that uh, uh, that it you can consent to being tied up. You can consent to uh, whipping or spanking up to a point where uh, there are some injuries. Uh, the sim it's a similar. 
uh, there is a similar uh, statues in the law, like in the UK and like in the Nordic countries. It's uh, all very similar. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, but uh, the ground grounding was we were okay in that matter. But, uh, and so we didn't have to worry about it. Yeah. Then we collaborated uh, with the people in the BDSM organizations who were also in the uh, gay leather club. So uh, they uh, provided us, uh, we could rent their uh, premises. They had a club, they had a club, and we could, we were allowed to be there for our first first meetings and uh -huh. and so we we put up uh, regular meetings there uh, but uh, it's funny and but sad at the same time there were people who didn't want to come to our meetings because they were hosted there in the gay leather club in ret retrospect we did a very large mistake in the beginning well, I think at the same time, it, uh, when you look back, it was a mistake, but I don't think the Icelandic society was ready for, for, for it. But uh, uh, that is, we decided to keep uh, the organization and keep stay in the closet. So do you feel keeping it in the closet was a mistake? I, I'm not... Yeah, that, that uh, in the retro re retrospect, it was a mistake. Okay. But but at the same time, uh, I don't think Icelandic society was ready for us coming out of the closet. After, after the meeting, uh, the first meeting, uh, we went on national television. Okay. Uh, there was a newscast program uh, that uh, wanted to interview us. And, you know, uh, uh, they did a short story about us, about the BDSM organization. <clears throat> At the time, nobody, we were not out of the closet. So we, we came behind, uh, we talked behind the uh, screen. So we, uh, we were just blacked uh, out. So there, were no, there was no person, it just shadow figures. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and the interview was, we just spoke about yeah what BDSM is consent and uh, safe, sane, consensual. You know these just and <clears throat> we're talking about educate education or things like that. And instead of showing it on prime time like the the show was usually hosted, uh, they kept the segment and put it uh, at the latest point in the schedule on a Monday evening. Mm, mm. So in, just to make sure that nobody would see it. How so some people must have seen it. How was the reaction? The reaction was, uh, there was a lot of people who shocked. I mean, it was an illness. It was crazy. You know, it was perverts. So we just stayed under the radar and just stayed there, kept, the, made the closet uh, roomy and comfy for everybody. Everybody's invited, all genders, everything, nothing matters. We just create a safe, safe space in the closet for all of us. Were you still meeting in this uh, gay space at that time? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. We, we were doing that and kept on doing that for years. So the Icelandic scene, <clears throat> Uh, rose up and it became uh, there was a need for it there was a there was a need in the society for so the months just got bigger and we all, all also created events and parties uh, <clears throat> and the scene uh, yeah imploded in 2007-2008 Let's take one step back, though, before we go yeah. down that section. Tell me, how many people were coming to your original gatherings? 20 up to 30 people. That's a good number. A yeah, very good number. Were they coming from all over Iceland? Uh, mostly the capital area, yeah. Okay, yeah. 
but we have we have about two hundred thousand people there, and the rest is spread across the country. Mm, mm, mm. You mentioned some people did not want to go because of the uh, being a gay space. Yeah. What did you do for them? Uh, nothing. They just uh, didn't come. Yeah. Oh, that's a shame. Yes. But it, it was. <clears throat> Yeah, but uh, what we didn't have any other opportunities for locations. So it was like, um, there's nothing else we can do about it. This is the only venue that uh, we can have at the moment. Uh, and so that was the, yeah, that was the only thing. Tell me about the venue. What did it have? Um, it was just a dark, small basement. Uh, with a dark room, small bar, a uh, couple of uh, 50 gallon drum, oil drums for tables. Um, yeah, it was kind of fun, sleazy, dark, shabby. Mm. Club. Yeah. Did it, did it have, uh, for example, slings? Did it have other? In the, in the, in the, in the dark room, yeah. There was a, there was a sling there, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. There were hooks in the. There were there were hooks, uh, eyeballs in the in the ceiling and, and things like that. Yeah. So they had some uh, basic things that you could use. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, how big was the uh, the gay club at that time? This SM club. It was not big. The 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 the, the, the scene was not big and. They were not very strict on dress code there. Uh, uh. So, but but the thing is, you have a small society, and and if you want to be overly strict on on dress codes, then you have a rubber night with the two rubber guys, yes. and you have a leather night with the three leather guys, yes. and and then one. Uh, army guy or whatever, whatever. You show yeah. one puppy. So so you have, if you want to do something, you have to invite everybody. How did the people uh, come together? So w were people comfortable being heterosexual BDSM people with <laughs> gay BDSM people? Yeah, but but in the beginning, uh, uh, we always we always presented the organization as pansexual. That was always oh. Oh. so, uh, but and in the beginning, we had probably about let's just say eight guys with two females. That was the proportion or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> and there was no sex or, or very little play in, in the meetings. It was just main, it was mainly just educational and, oh, wow. and kind of kind of a munches with with some educational aspects to it. So you have mentioned these munches. Uh, how many people would come to those? Uh, well, in the beginning, uh, the, the munches, they outgrew that premises. Uh, and so we were able to, to put the, the munches onto some of the local pubs or, or venues. Uh, and they were up to 30, 20, 25, 30 people, 35, something. That was that was the norm for for oh. the munches. Wow, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had one uh, website. Uh, there was a there was a local community website or, or a social media site uh, that everybody used. And when the scene imploded, split in two, uh, that website went down. So. Uh, cer certainly in 2008, uh, there was nothing. There was no way to communicate with other uh, Kingsters or, or communicate or, or advertise anything. Let's come back to this because you okay. have mentioned that the scene imploded. What led up to this? Basically, you had two influential persons who were friends who became enemies and they uh, kind of 
uh, split the scene, you know, you're either against us or with us. And so the scene splits in three. You know, one group, with, uh, one part with person A, one group with person B, and then you have a whole lot of people, I don't want to take participate in this fight. Hmm. In such a small community, that's very surprising that there would have been such a strong breakup like that. Always when you have groups, you have some friction, you know, mm. uh, between who's in power, who's in not. Uh, and that might play some part in it, but the what what did everything was the this personal for feud with from these two basically from these two persons i have heard of this because uh over the last couple of years i have been trying very hard to find people in iceland to interview and i must honestly tell you it was very 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 impossible yeah. And I thought, what must have gone on to have created such animosity? So that's why I took another direction and was able to meet with you. Yeah. But uh, what became, what came out of that? Uh, out of it. Uh was in 2009. I started the Munches. Uh, before the implosion, uh, the Munches were run by the BDSM organization. It's a top-down process. <clears throat> uh, when I started, I, I decided, okay, we're not going to go that way again. So I, I, I basically built it up as a grassroots movement. Okay. Uh, start from the bottom and you build it up. Uh, I started the Munches, just said, I'm going to be at this venue at this time. Everybody's welcome. So you start with five people, four, five persons. And that kept on growing. Uh, we outgrew that room that we had been occupying. Uh, so you went to a bigger one and a bigger one. And it just grew from there. And kind of... Uh, I wanted to be, you know, you know, that nobody was organizing it. But later I found out, well, you have to have somebody in charge. I have to have somebody who is calling, calling the shots. And I did it for the first uh, 100 munches. Uh, 100 something. And it was kind of sometimes difficult. Uh, uh, venue holders were not always glad to have us. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, we were kicked out of some venues uh, and you know not kicked out but you know yeah you should not you should not come here again or or, or we're occupied and, and things like that mm, yeah. and, but but there was nothing you know there were not nothing wrong seeing people not showing up in fetish gear or anything uh, only only the discussions could be about kinky subjects or something like that. How did you see people uh, grow with their kink? When I started to host the parties, both in the leather club and at my home, uh, <clears throat> there were maybe 10, 15, 20 people showing up. But it was usually, in the beginning, it was just me playing with some people that was uh, <clears throat> that was that was the norm for the first parties people showed up in some fetish gear awesome but it was me playing about with with this one that one or something like that uh, but I still remember probably almost eight years or nine the sound of spanking that somebody else was that somebody else was doing, not me, and it was so you know it. It was just growing up. People were starting to uh, 
uh, yeah, all the people were starting to play or do something. So it was, uh, yeah, I, I love I love the sound of spanking in the morning, you know. <laughs> so it was it was just awesome, <clears throat> and just slowly building up, and it was just people getting more comfortable uh, being themselves and doing doing what they want, did. Yeah. How is the current scene? It's extremely diverse. Uh, and uh, for, for the last year, uh, they have been running, uh, they have been running the Munches uh, on Discord because of COVID. Mm -hmm. and but and we had to shut down all play parties mm, yes but the scene is getting more and more public it's more open uh, you can uh, I have for example with went with my friends on uh, on the club that I can see in your left corner on your screen uh, we have been there in fetish care and all 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 fetish uh, regalia, yeah, and there's no problem being in public and playing and uh, being being outside in fetish gear. Yeah. Do you participate in the pride parades? Uh, yes, when we uh, had been running the munches for some time, uh, we decided it was time to. Uh, revive the BDSM organization. Okay. <clears throat> and, and to start co collaborating with uh, the queer organization uh, in, in, in one way or another. And so we ended up with uh, applying for to become uh, associated of official associated member of the queer organization. Okay. There, there is a process for uh, organizations and group to connect uh, under the queer umbrella, I can say that. And in 2016, we applied to become a, a, a member of it. And uh, there was a general meeting where members of the queer organization uh, were able to vote on it. Uh, it was accepted, but then all hell broke loose. Uh, the old generation that had been working with, uh, participating in, in with the queer organization for for some time, uh, they stepped back and said, "Hey, wait, wait a minute, something is wrong." And there was a, a serious. Uh, there was a serious feud going on. Uh, really, it was really bad. Uh, it threw a lot of BDSM people back in the closet. Uh, and a lot of uh, gays uh, quit the queer organization, left it. And so there was a lot of feud. There was a lot of animosity and a, a lot of bad, bad things going on for quite some time. And... <clears throat> So there was another meeting, uh, and and it would it was ruled that the general meeting that it was in March two thousand sixteen, it was illegal. It was not uh, there were some legalities on the meeting that so it was scrapped. And there was a there was a lot of lot of noise. It was uh, we had uh, it was a lot of media. It was a kind of a media war going on. Uh, people ended up on front page of newspapers and and on uh, on television news and things like that. Uh, and uh, to make this long story short, uh, there was uh, the biggest uh, general meeting. There was a, they, they had to put in uh, some uh, external uh, envoy to. Uh, to get the parties within the queer organization to reconcile. There was some, we had to, there was, and basically, and uh, we had the biggest, 
Yeah. Uh, probably about 10 times bigger than the general meeting in March. The general meeting that was special meeting that was held in September uh, 2016. There were about, more than 10 times uh, more people who showed up there. The biggest general meeting ever. And it was voted on again. And it was uh, accepted again to have to have that to make the Icelandic BDSM organization uh, uh, associated part under the queer umbrella. And uh, yeah, and then the years uh, year after that went into uh, you know just trying to everybody getting along, making peace with everybody. And it was a very difficult time for, for all people. Has there been peace now? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, some people will never accept it. All the people. And uh, uh, to be fair, a lot of people uh, of the old generation, uh, they were against it in the beginning. But when they realized that uh, that the the talk against BDSM people from within the queer organization, from the queer community, uh, used the same phrases that were used against them ten years earlier or twenty years earlier. Uh, only thing you had to only thing was changed that was you you changed homosexual for BDSM. Um, again, yeah. the outside image of Iceland is that it is a very progressive society. Do you, how do you see it? When coming to uh, sex, uh, uh, porn, porn is illegal here in Iceland. Really? Yeah. I'm surprised. <clears throat> so yeah, it's it's it, and it's um, there was a very heated discussion on social media uh, uh, earlier this spring regarding OnlyFans, and so it, it is it is and and also the, the <laughs> there is uh, we have the Scandinavian model for uh, prostitution, so you can. Uh, it's not equal, legal, illegal to uh, be a prostitute, but it's illegal to buy. There is not a lot of support for uh, people in sex work. Wow, uh, that is that is. Um, but I, I sensed a little uh, notch in that direction, in right direction, getting more support for people in sex work. But it's it's very heated topic. Where do you see the community in five years? I think we will see uh, uh, more people uh, do about uh, the distinction between BDSM orientation and just being interested in BDSM training. Uh, I think we, we will see some distinction there but I think we, uh, we do not want to go into you know your real BDSM and you're not uh, that, that that rabbit hole is you you don't want to go there uh, the BDSM community is by far uh, consisting of people who are pan or bisexual mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it is it is uh, I, I think uh, the proportional, uh, it is way out of all proportions uh, compared to elsewhere in, in here in Iceland. So how do you uh, mean that? Uh, straight people are only about 50% mm -hmm. of, of, the, of the BDSM community. Okay. Instead of 80, 90% uh, in general. Yeah. Yeah, and but uh, the proportion of uh, people uh, of uh, of homosexuals and lesbians is is probably the same as in in the general about five percent. Okay. 
uh, <clears throat> we have a uh, well, we have a large uh, proportion of uh, non-binary and trans persons. Ah, I see. And uh, so I think we are just seeing more diversity, uh, and it's kind of the. Uh, in the parties that I'm, uh, we're hosting monthly about uh, the monthly play parties that we are hosting, uh, we have about between 50 and 70 guests. And because we have to be open to everything and because everybody is exposed to everything. So you're not only seeing leather people or not only seeing rubber people, you see all the spectrum. Yeah. And that opens your eyes to yeah. diversity. What is the biggest misconception about you? I don't know. Uh, assertive, but, but I'm mostly just cuddly. <laughs> well, I, 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 I use, I, I use, I, I, I identify as a princess. I'm a princess. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what, what do you mean by that? And I, I, who doesn't love attention and praises and being pampered as a princess or something? I see. Yeah. Well, Magnus Hakunarsson, yeah. oh. I thank you very much for a wonderful interview for Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. Yeah.